Awesome. So I'm Annalisa, and I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator for ASGSR Student Chapter. And today joining us is Dr. Nicole Wagner. Um, she is uh, the president and CEO of Lambda Vision, a biotechnology company developing a protein-based artificial retina to treat patients bl blinded by uh, retinal degenerative um, diseases. Dr. Wagner, um, obtained her PhD in molecular and cell biology from the University of Connecticut in 2013. She has won many awards, including um, Connecticut Technology Council's Women of um, Innovation Award, um, Connecticut uh, Magazine's 40 Under 40, um, the 2020 Women in Aerospace Achievement Award, the 2021 BioCT Rising Inter um, Entrepreneur um, of the Year Award, and most re recently, she was listed as one of the Healthcare Technology Report's um, top 25 women leaders in biotechnology for 2021 and Hartford Business Journal Power 50 in 2022. In this webinar, we will learn about the work that Lambda Vision is doing to leverage microgravity on the ISS to manufacture their protein-based artificial retina to restore visions to millions of patients blinded by end-stage retinal um, degenerative diseases. Without further ado, um, Dr. Nicole Wagner, take it away. Thank you, Annalisa, for having me today. Um, and it's a pleasure really to talk to this, this group, and I hope to see many of you again at ASGSR. Um, I am going to turn my camera off because sometimes I have internet issues, but if there are any questions, certainly I'll turn it on again at the, the end. Um, so let me bring this up. All right, you see the full screen now? Yep. All right, so the title of my talk today is New Frontiers Manufacturing a Protein-Based Artificial Retina in Low Earth Orbit. Um, my background, so I have a PhD in molecular biology, and as we kind of navigate through this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about how a PhD molecular biologist got involved in aerospace. Um, so for those of you who aren't in a traditional engineering type pathway, there is still lots of opportunities to be involved in doing microgravity research. So I'd like to start my talk out with having all of you to imagine being at the height of your career and being forced to give it all up because you can no longer see a computer screen. Imagine having to ask your friends and family for a car ride because you've lost your license. Now imagine finding out that you're going to be a grandparent for the first time only to know that you'll never be able to read your grandchild a book. Retinitis pigmentosa is a devastating disease which affects about 1.5 million people globally. This disease works by affecting your peripheral vision first, and then over time it'll start to narrow until a patient is completely blind. Age-related macular degeneration, it is the leading cause of blindness for patients age 55 and older. Uh, it affects about 30 million people in the United States. Um, there's about 10 million of those patients that are, are in the blinding stages. And this disease tends to affect your central vision first, and then over time, that'll start to expand until the patient is completely blind. Now, while there are some treatments for these diseases, most of these treatments only slow the progression of the disease. So what you'll see on the left-hand side is our founder, Bob Burge. He's in black and white. And what you'll see on the right-hand side is the current state-of-the-art electro-based prosthetics. These technologies really offer very low digitalized resolution. So you can see it's a very pixelated, granulated uh, image here barely enough to distinguish between light and dark. This technology is actually being reimbursed at over $150,000 per eye, and it's just not good enough. So what Lambda Vision solution is, is we have a high resolution protein-based artificial retina that can be placed in the back of the eye through a surgical procedure very similar to a retinal detachment procedure. Um, this increases the adoption potential of the technology. The goal of our technology is to replace the function of your damaged rods and cones. So these are your light sensing cells in the eye um, to provide high resolution for these patients. So unlike some of the competing electrode-based technologies, we're not limited in the number of electrodes placed on a chip, but rather looking at molecular packing of protein molecules on a scaffold. So how do we make this artificial retina? This artificial retina is comprised of many layers of the light-activated protein bacteria rhodopsin. 
Bacteriodopsin is a light activated proton pump. So what it means is it pumps a proton from the intracellular surface of the protein in response to light to the extracellular surface of the protein. And it does that because it contains an all trans retinal chromophore, which is covalently linked to a lysine residue in HeLa C7. Now the structure that we use for the artificial retina is this two dimensional hexagonal lattice of trimers uh, known as the purple membrane. This is in your bottom left hand corner. So you can see each individual monomer, the yellow, the green and the red, all of those come together to form a trimer. Those trimers come together to form this lattice structure. And that's what gives this protein its inherent stability. So bacteriodopsin itself um, has a thermal stability which exceeds 85 degrees Celsius. So for most people who work with proteins, this is really unheard of. Um, and it's that structure that we use to actually make the artificial retina construct. So we have our ion permeable scaffold here. This is Dacron. That's the basis for our artificial retina. We use a polycation. We do protein, polycation, protein, polycation. And we do that multiple times so that we can absorb enough incident light to generate an ion gradient that can stimulate the remaining bipolar and ganglion cells in the eye. So before I go further, what I like to do is always describe what's happening in your retina. So I'm hoping that those in attendance right now have a nice healthy retina. And what's happening is that your retina is taking the light in the room and it's converting that light into a signal that can be sent to the bipolar cells, the ganglion cells, and then eventually to the optic nerve. Now, if you have retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, those cells which absorb light, your photoreceptor cells, they start to die. As those cells die, your eyes become incapable of taking light energy and converting it into a signal that can be sent to the brain. So what we do is we put our artificial retina technology subretinally where those cells would normally exist. Now in response to light, the protein is going to pump protons, so hydrogen ions, towards your bipolar and ganglion cells which will be picked up by receptors, in this case, it's acid sensing ion channels, to send a signal to the bipolar cells, ganglion cells, and then to the optic nerve. So there are a number of competitors in the space. Um, I like to break them down into two categories. The first are the more hardware-driven technologies. So these are your retinal prosthetics. And what you'll see here is two on the left-hand side. We have Second Sight, Pixie and Vision. These are really engineering marvels. You have battery packs, wires, goggles, um, but with that added complexity comes a much more complex surgery. And then after all of that, they're very limited in resolution. Um, again, the second site one was that very digitalized resolution that you saw in the very beginning. Um, this technology actually has been discontinued um, and Pixie Vision, which was initially targeting uh, RP, retinitis pigmentosa market, uh, has now pivoted to a dry AMD market. Now, Lambda Vision's technology, again, much simpler surgery. So we're under an hour to implant this into the subretinal space. Because we're using a light-activated protein, we don't need external hardware, battery packs, goggles. And then most importantly, the biomimetic design of our artificial retina improves resolution in comparison to some of these electrode-based prosthetics. Now, some of the other competitors here are the more gene therapy type approaches. So you see optogenetics uh, and gene therapy right there. What I didn't mention at the beginning of my talk was that retinitis pigmentosa is controlled by over 100 different genes. So with about 100,000 people in the United States and 100 genes, that's about 1,000 patients per gene, which makes it very, very difficult to develop a therapy that can treat all of these patients. It also is very expensive. Um, our technology is designed to help our P patients regardless of the gene type. Um, additionally, when you look at optogenetic therapies, so this is what you see on the far left, you have a rat with a fiber optic in its brain. Um, one of the big things here is that these optogenetic therapies are also using proteins very similar to bacteria adopsin. Um, they often use channel adopsin, which is a potassium ion pump, halo adopsin, which is a chloride ion pump. Um, but they also, these two proteins absorb on the periphery of the visible spectrum. So halo rhodopsin is around 600 nanometers, channel rhodopsin is around 400 nanometers, so close to the UV. Um, that makes it very difficult uh, to stimulate these cells without goggles or external devices and signal amplification. By the way that we actually manufacture our artificial retina through this layer by layer approach, 
we get a much higher optical density, which allows for us to absorb more uh, ambient light and generate that into a signal that can be sent to the, the neural circuitry and then to the brain. So the way that we manufacture these um, terrestrially is in our laboratories in Farmington, Connecticut. And we do this through a process called layer by layer assembly. Um, and these images here are actually images of our laboratories in, in Farmington. We have uh, Regina here in the top left hand image, did them in the top right. Um, and what we do is we grow and pro our, harvest our protein from the native organism. So the native organism that we use is Helobacterium salinarum. Once we purify that protein, we then um, deposit it onto the scaffold using a layer by layer approach. So we use alternating layers of the protein and polycation onto that scaffold. We do this in a way so that bacteria dopsin is consistently oriented so that we can generate a unidirectional ion gradient. And this is particularly important because we want the protons to pump only in one direction. You can imagine if you have double coding, that that signal is going to cancel each other out because you have protons pumping up and you have protons pumping uh, in the opposite down in the opposite direction. Once we have our artificial retina construct, we then take these sheets, we then resize them, we package them, and then we terminally sterilize them. Then uh, what we do here, as you can see with these layer by layer assembled films, we have these films are very highly oriented. So that again, as I mentioned, we get that unidirectional ion gradient. And the center image, what you'll see is that um, like most drugs, when you think of this in the, in the case of a drug, you're thinking about it in terms of dosing. So we can think about dosing in terms of the number of layers of protein deposited onto the scaffold. What we're targeting right now is about 200 layers, which is the optimal density used to absorb ambient light and stimulate the artificial retina or stimulate the, the neural circuitry. The scaffold that we use in the back of the eye has been used in the ocular space before. And then again, it's incredibly stable, this protein. So I mentioned the high thermal stability. It has a very high photochemical stability. And this leads to a very long-term implant um, lifetime. So in this far right-hand image, what you'll see is implants that were generated today versus implants that were generated over six years ago and stored in a vitreous buffer. And they all have a very similar absorption profile around 560 nanometers, which shows that the activity of the protein is still, um, is still there and it's a very stable uh, film. So the next question that I usually get is, well, that's really great, Nicole. How do you know that this actually works? Um, so this is really only a snapshot of some of the data that we've collected. Um, this was all published in the Journal of Neural Engineering at the end of 2021, at the end of last year. Uh, and please feel free to take a look at that, that citation to, if you want to learn a little bit more. Um, but what we did in order to demonstrate proof of concept is that we had a rat model of retinitis pigmentosa. This was a P23H rat, so it's a transgenic rat that has a mutation which causes retinitis pigmentosa. We took those rats, um, we excised their retina, so we took the retina out. We put our retina, our artificial retina technology subretinally, so below the retina. And then we monitored using um, very tiny electrodes to be able to detect neural signals. Um, and what we were able to demonstrate is that this protein or this artificial retina is effective, selective, sensitive. or increased light intensity, we get an increase in activation efficiency. Activation efficiency is really the number of action potentials that we're able to, to target. So we can actually count those. Um, and when we put the implant in an orientation to pump protons towards the bipolar and ganglion cells, we get a great activation efficiency. When we flip that implant over, so now we're pumping uh, protein uh, protons away from the bipolar and ganglion cells, we get very low activation efficiency. Um, so then what we did is we took that same set of data and instead of plotting it against light intensity, we plotted it against time. And what you'll see is that most of our signals occur around 150 milliseconds. Um, and this is important because this is on the same time scale as a native photoreceptor cell or rat photoreceptor cell. So this is showing some of the temporal sensitivity 
uh, of the artificial retina. And this is in line with something that would support uh, functional vision. And then lastly, these are, those first two experiments were single electrode experiments. We conducted a multi-electrode array experiment. Now that experiment was important because some of the feedback that we got from the first couple of studies was, you know, how do you know that this isn't just a light detector? How do you know that you have any sensitivity? So what we did is we took this multi-electrode array, which you can see here, you have A through H and one through eight, so an eight by eight array. Um, and our goal was to shine light on a single electrode and only have that electrode fire. So that's exactly what we're able to demonstrate. And this is just a snapshot of that data. So if you shine light on electrode uh, E4 or E5, that's the one that fires. So this allows us to show that we have sensitivity down to 200 micrometers in pixel diameter. Then we have done some in vivo method development in rats. Um, this particular study here was in a healthy rat. So we weren't looking at uh, efficacy here. We were really looking at surgical placement and tolerability of the artificial retina in the subretinal space. So what you'll see here in the left-hand corner is a fundus image of our artificial retina in the subretinal space. In the center image here, you'll see our artificial retina Again, placed in the subretinal space, this is optical coherence tomography. So you can see the arrow pointing to the artificial retina between the retinal pigment epithelium and the bipolar and ganglion cell layer. And then here on the far right, you'll see blue, red, and green. Um, this is looking at ERG. So ERG is electroretinography. Um, you can kind of think of this like an EKG, right, of the, of the heart where we're taking these tiny electrodes and what we're looking at at the output is a bunch of signals on a screen. So a bunch of spikes on a screen and we can count, count those. Um, when you look at the three groups here, we see that they have very similar profiles. So what this indicates to us and this method indicates to us is that there is no difference um, in terms of inflammation between these three groups, which generates a, which says to us that these have been tolerated for the six weeks uh, in the back of the eye. We have also done some in vivo surgical development in pigs as well. This is really important because what we're going to do for our eye and D enabling studies is going to be putting these in the subretinal space um, into pigs. Uh, and so this study here in the 1230 position, you can actually see the artificial retina in the subretinal space of this pig. Um, we did a six pig, six week study. It allowed us to establish the procedures for subretinal de delivery. So like I said, something very similar to a retinal detachment procedure. Um, we also established the size and the shape of the implant, which is important. Um, and like I said, this is going to support our non-clinical toxicity studies and eventual IND filing. So our timeline to development, um, we are right now in 2022, uh, we're focusing a lot on GMP manufacturing of the artificial retina, some subchronic toxicity studies, um, and then as we move into 2024-25, looking at chronic toxicity studies, so these are long-term animal studies, uh, filing an IND and hopefully having our phase one clinical trial uh, at the end of 2025, beginning of 2026. Our team uh, consists of myself and Dr. Jordan Greco. Both were graduate students in Dr. Bob Burge's lab at the University of Connecticut. Um, we both have been studying bacteria adoption for a number of years. My background, as I mentioned, is in molecular biology. So what I did is I optimized bacteria adoption for device architectures like holography, photovoltaics, chemical sensors. Um, and Jordan's background is in physical chemistry. So he's done a lot of the spectroscopy uh, and is now focused a lot on the implant manufacturing and quality control. Uh, and then you can see our board of directors below which support a lot of the work that Jordan and I have been doing over the past several years. Um, so today we have a little over $10 million of funding into the company. Most of this funding has been from non-dilutive sources. Uh, so we've been funded through the National Eye Institute, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, Fight for Sight. Um, and then you'll see here NASA, uh, Cases Boeing, uh, and so the next big question that I often get is, why is NASA so interested in, in what you're doing? Um, so really this all started at Mass Challenge in 2016. So Lambda Vision was a Mass Challenge uh, Cases Boeing prize winner. Um, and we participated in that program 
And that's really how we met uh, some of the leaders at CASIS and learned about how we can get involved in doing microgravity research. So the NASA awards that we were se secured um, are supporting work over the next six years or the next three years uh, to the International Space Station to evaluate and improve on orbit processes for layer by layer deposition of proteins. All of the work that we're doing, it's foundational. It can support a number of process improvements across a number of technology applications, which is really important. Um, and then this funding also supports a lot of the work we're doing from a CNC and assay development uh, perspective as well for commercialization of the artificial retina. And so this image here is a picture of the CEO of uh, Space Tango, Twyman Clements, and myself at the ISS RDC R&D our ISS R&D conference, um, where we were awarded a prize for the preliminary work that we did on the ISS in 2018. So now I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, switch gears, and just talk about why microgravity um, and some of the work that we're doing in microgravity for the development of this artificial retina. So I mentioned that we make this artificial retina through a process called layer by layer electrostatic deposition. And you can actually see a cartoon here on the right hand side of our artificial retina dipping apparatus. So we have a, it really works in an XY plane where we have six beakers, um, where the first beaker is our uh, a solution, a polymer solution. We have a series of washes, another protein solution, and then some more washes. And what we do is this process happens over 200 times. Um, and this process is very much subject to the effects of gravity. So you can imagine in those beakers, you're going to get a gradient of the solutions. That gradient can reduce implant homogeneity. Additionally, um, as we go through that process, any uh, challenge or any uh, imperfection in the films gets compounded over the 200 layers. So if you have an imperfection in layer 50, Imagine by layer 200, that gets even exacerbated a little bit more. Um, so that can lead to uh, challenges in the impact in the performance of the artificial retina, um, and ultimately a reduction in the usable area for preclinical experiments and clinical trials. Um, so this is a cartoon, really, to just kind of generate visually as much as you can imagine what is happening between Earth and microgravity. So in an Earth-based environment, uh, we have our protein molecules, you can imagine, kind of all spread out. Um, and then when you have that deposited onto our scaffolds, you kind of get this irregular deposition. On the right-hand side, again, you have much more, this is in microgravity, you have a much more homogeneous ordering of the protein molecules, which leads to a much more homogeneous thin film overall. So as I mentioned, um, we got involved with working in microgravity because of our involvement with Mass Challenge in 2016. Um, and so this is a perfect case for anybody who's sitting in the, in the audience here listening to this of, of really just kind of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, when we joined Mass Challenge, what we knew is that we had a, a challenge in how we manufactured the artificial retina. We tried spray coating. We tried uh, dip coating. We tried uh, spin coating. We tried other fluidic deposition methods. And all of these were, were leading to films that were just of, of okay quality. Um, and so it wasn't that we couldn't, we never imagined going to microgravity, but we just didn't know how to get there. Um, and so this was a case where I was sitting at a table uh, and the organizers came around and they, they knocked on the table and they said, you know, there's, there's pizza down the hall, come check out this presentation. Uh, there's an opportunity for grant funding. Uh, and I, I literally was sitting at my desk thinking, all right, I don't really have very much to do today. I will head down there and see what's what's going on. Um, so I sat down and I listened to the presentation by Cindy Buteau. She's there on the left-hand side. And she started talking about the work that ISS National Labs was doing and the work in terms of bioprinting and some of the tissue engineering. And it was at that point that it really clicked for me that there's a way to use microgravity to benefit patients on Earth um, and to leverage microgravity for manufacturing. And so we really started to develop our proposal at that time. Uh, we sat down and worked with the team. 
And probably the best thing that happened out of that was them pairing us with Space Tango. Uh, so what Space Tango does is they are a payload developer and operator of a microgravity that builds uh, middleware to support experiments going to the International Space Station. Um, and this was important for us because, like I said, I'm a molecular biologist. I have no idea how to take something from you know what I'm doing in my laboratory and automate it on on the ISS. When I started these initial experiments, <coughs> and I sat down and I talked with my my research advisor, you know, he's like, I don't know how we're going to do this. We're going to have to figure out how do you what's the security that you need to do these things on the space station. How do you how are you going to miniaturize this? We had a very open beaker system. It was huge. It was heavy. It was cumbersome. Um, and we had to take that very, very big system, miniaturize it, change it to a fluidic device, and think about all of the variables that change from a terrestrial environment to a microgravity environment. And that's what we did with, with Space Tango. And so you can see some of our team here in the middle image. Um, it's not everyone. I know Annalisa now, you guys have heard from her early on. She's been supporting some of our work in terms of materials development. Uh, and has really, it's been a great team to, to work with. Um, so once we got paired with Space Tango, we now had a way to miniaturize what we're doing, take it to space, and it allowed us the opportunity to really focus, or LAM Division, the opportunity to focus on what was most important for us, which is how do we take this protein and deposit it on a scaffold and get this into patients and eventually, you know, into the clinic at some point. So interestingly, um, once we were paired with Space Tango, we flew our first experiment in uh, December of 2018. Um, and a lot of the questions that I get and I think about of when we were, were trying to do this on the International Space Station and before we even put the experiment onto the ISS was, you know, does this make sense? Could you actually manufacture this long term on the International Space Station? Um, and what's important to note here in, in our technology is that, one, we want to increase the homogeneity, stability, and performance of our artificial retina. Um, but also, what what's inherent about the protein and the technology itself that makes this feasible to do in microgravity? And so this protein, as I mentioned, is very, very stable. So we do everything in an ambient environment. So that allows us a lot more flexibility in doing some experiments on the International Space Station. Additionally, our processing is entirely automated, so we don't need astronaut time or additional ISS lab resources, uh, which is also helpful in, in how we're thinking about some of the feasibility of these experiments. Um, and then as we think about our initial market of retinitis pigmentosa, it is an orphan indication. So it is a smaller patient population, which is, allows us uh, very manageable production volumes necessary to supply clinical trials. Uh, so you can actually see here, this is a, a image of our cube lab um, with our logo on it. This is a prototype device that we did in the very beginning to just test out feasibility. Uh, and this is an image of our very, very first experiment to the ISS. Um, what you'll notice here in this design is that we actually had a, a bubble here that's very common in a microgravity environment. And a lot of time can be spent on how do you mitigate bubble formation. Um, but it was the proof of concept to show that we had some layering. Uh, we didn't get layering where we saw that bubble formation, but it was enough to allow us to kind of validate the experiment and the feasibility of the experiment for future um, work on the International Space Station. So to date, we have flown six times to the ISS um, with the support of NASA SBIR and NRA funding. Uh, we flew on SpaceX 16. NG-14, NG-15, SpaceX-24, Crew-4, and Crew-5. A lot of the work that we've done over the past six flights have really helped to validate um, the hardware, the fluidics, the operational controls, the quality measurements, and allowed us to produce multiple 200 layer thin films in microgravity um, using the Cube Lab system that Space Tango works with. Um, before I go on, what I wanted to just kind of say here is that I'm going to just take you through some of the last couple of experiments and show how we've what we've learned and how we started to iterate. Um, and then I'll close with with some of the work that we're doing now. Um, 
So I mentioned the first couple of flights, we had SpaceX 16, NG15, 14, um, which was really kind of building on the hardware, the software, understanding the protein, understanding the microgravity environment. SpaceX 24 was really the first time that we were trying to develop a, a true 200 layer implant. Um, and so that's what you're gonna see here. So on SpaceX 24, uh, it was the first time that we completed a 200 layer experiment in microgravity. Um, that was a huge success, uh, but you know what? We still had some work to do. So um, what we did learn from that experiment is that, you know, we had to do a little bit of handholding. Um, we had to work with the system. We had uh, engineers on the Space Tango side that were helping us through the development of this payload. Um, and we're working on some of the uh, parameters and controls uh, and the fluidics there. Um, and we did see some aggregates along the center line of that, that um, cube or that film right there. Um, but what we were also able to look at here is we were getting great image quality. quality. Um, that allowed us to develop better quality systems uh, for our Crew 4 and Crew 5 flights. Um, and then what we also worked on extensively were some very, very rigorous ground uh, protocols. And that's really important because one of the things that we think about as we transition from the work that we're doing on the bench to the ISS is how do we iterate very, very quickly so that we can get the data that we need uh, to support the timelines necessary for commercial development. Um, so these were all things that were built into some of the work that we did on SpaceX X24. Um, from SpaceX 24, we then flew on Crew 4. Um, and so this was the goal of the Crew 4 mission was really to look at terrestrial benchtop testing um, and what we learned from that and then apply it to what we were seeing in microgravity. Um, and we were able to do that. And what we were able to do in that design here is we had two cube labs. Um, in the two cube labs, we had two layering chambers. So the layering chamber is what you'll see here in this top right hand corner uh, with that, that purple line there. Uh, and the goal was in each chamber that we wanted to put deposit 200 layers of our protein. Uh, and then we were gonna compare those films from one cube to the other to show that we have control of the system, the hardware and the environment as well. And that's exactly what we were able to see. So you can see this is significantly improved from our initial uh, SpaceX 24 proof of concept flight. We had in our first cube, PAR-05, uh, two chambers reached 200 layers. You see a beautiful purple film there. Uh, in our PAR-04 chamber, we had one reach 200 layers. We had another one that we uh, had reached only 50 layers, which actually was a great comparison because we can look at the thin film thickness uh, as well as the integrity of those films and compare that to the 200 layer. So it was, again, uh, a very successful flight. Uh, and so what we do with these films, once these are actual images of our films on orbit, uh, was to deintegrate. So we deintegrated these at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we did this in August of this year. Uh, you can actually see some of the Space Tango team starting to kind of deintegrate and, and break apart those chambers. Um, once they separate the chambers, what they do is they send the films and that Falcon tube on the far right hand side here to the Lamb Division laboratories for assessment. Um, and one of the ways that we look at what is what's going on with this film, thin film, how does it look compared to some of the terrestrial controls um, is through a process called confocal microscopy. So we do a lot of confocal microscopy. Um, and in the interest of time, I am just gonna show you a snapshot of what some of that looks like. So this is an actual film uh, from the SpaceX Crew 4 uh, launch. Uh, and what we did is we took time points 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. These are the periphery of the thin film. Uh, and we monitored that uh, and imaged that through confocal. What you can see is you can actually see some very nice coating along the fibers here of, of the film. Uh, and this is when you compare it to some of the terrestrial controls, much more homogenous. Um, we're getting some really good layering here. We're getting consistent thickness across the thin film. Um, but again, one thing that we did see in this particular film is that we did have some, um, you see almost like a lighter trail in the middle. Uh, we think that's due to some potential shearing 
effects that we're seeing on on the the film. And so that's something that we are targeting with our SpaceX uh, Crew 5 flight, which is actually on the International Space Station right now. And it launched on October 5th, so a couple days ago. Uh, so between our deintegration on Crew 4 uh, and the initial Crew 5 flight, we did a number of ground controls, um, optimized those parameters and conditions, and those optimized conditions are now being flown on the ISS and will be tested um, very shortly. Uh, so this is just kind of reiterating what I just said about the Crew-5 flight, um, where we're just improving on what we saw from Crew uh, SpaceX Crew-4. Now, I have just one more slide after this one. You know, all of the work that we're doing at LAM Division and at Space Tango beyond the artificial retina has just a number of, of broader impacts. Um, you know, when I started this talk off, I talked about bacteriodopsin, my role in bacteriodopsin for devices. Uh, this protein, because it pumps protons and there is a charge separation, it has been used and studied for things like optical data storage, associative processing, pattern recognition, um, chemical and environmental toxin detection. You can see actually here in the top uh, left and center images here, some prototypes of devices that we developed. Um, but a lot of the challenges in developing those technologies rely on really having very homogenous, either thin films deposited on various substrates or homogenous um, protein uh, across, a, you know, whether it's a hydrogel or something like that. And so as we're continuing to build the work on the artificial retina, there's a lot of applications that it can be extended to beyond uh, just that. And then when you look outside of bacteriodopsin, there is the field of biosensors, wound healing, of course, is a huge one, uh, tissue engineering, and I'm sure you've, you've all heard some talks on tissue engineering, that's a, a huge field right now um, with a lot of promise, anti-biofouling. And then what I didn't spend a ton of time talking about today uh, is the work that we put into um, manufacturing this in microgravity and what is often called good manufacturing practices. So any product that is developed um, for potential clinical use has to follow some good manufacturing practices. And so as we're developing these payloads, um, we're thinking about what that might look like on an international space station or a future commercial space station. And we're starting to build out um, that quality system uh, internally and with Space Tango. And so all of this can be applied to other applications as well. And then my last slide here um, is just to show, you know, I talked about bacteriodopsin. I talked about my role as a, as a molecular biologist. Um, but some of you that are listening in might say, all right, well, maybe, maybe I'm not a scientist. Maybe I want to do something else. Um, and so this is really to show the many possibilities of work being done in, in aerospace. So we were introduced to Victor Buckley, um, who is an anthropologist. He is the principal investigator leading a team on the material and manufacturing culture on the ISS. Um, and it is a study uh, that has been funded for about five years or will be funded for a total of five years, um, looking at what does manufacturing on the International Space Station look like? What does that involve? Uh, and so these are some images of, of Victor in our lab. Uh, and he just came a couple months ago uh, to look at what it takes to really take something that is traditionally done terrestrially uh, and carry that out on the International Space Station. So. Uh, the possibilities for work in microgravity and being involved in microgravity extend far beyond just the science. Um, and so there is, uh, I think, now a little bit for everyone on the International Space Station. Um, as I mentioned, there's just a couple of, of papers here. Uh, if anybody is interested, I can also send these to Annalisa as well. Um, just talking about some of the work that Lambda Division is doing, some of the work that I described. Uh, as well as uh, some of the future work on the International Space Station. And so with that, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have.
Thank you so much. Um, as uh, Dr. Wagner said, she is taking questions. Um, I have one to start us off. Um, how is that transition from a PhD program and graduating in a PhD program to running um, Lamb Division as a CEO and president? It is a challenge, right? It is certainly very difficult. Um, and there's a lot to learn, right? I started off um, in high school, you know, thinking about getting into a science role, but I really didn't know what a scientist did. Um, you know, I had, you know, my, my, my parents weren't scientists. Um, so when I left high school, I said, all right, I'm going to become a doctor because I knew what a doctor did. So I packed up, left my house in, in Massachusetts, flew to Florida state with my whole family, um, and joined a, a pre medical program. Um, after a year at Florida State, it was very different than, than being where I was. Uh, I was very homesick. I transferred back um, and I joined the research lab in Bob Burgess group only to check a box on a medical school application. Literally, it was, it was that simple. Uh, I, you know, I was like, all right, they say you need to do research if you're going to go to medical school. So I said, all right, here's a lab. Uh, my very first year in Bob Burge's lab, I literally cleaned glassware for an entire year and scrubbed benches. Um, but what it did for me is it allowed me to see what is going on in, in, a, in a research group. So I was seeing really awesome translational research being done. Um, I was interacting with the scientists. You know, I, I wasn't these Bill Nye the science guy or, you know, these pinky in the brain scientists. These are real people doing real work that has applications to, to patients. Um, and so fast forward after that year, I asked Bob Burge, I said, you know, can I stay in your lab and continue to do research? And he said, yes, that'd be great. So here I am a junior, um, as a junior in Bob Burge's lab, I was getting closer to, to my senior year. And he said, well, I think you should apply for the PhD program, Nicole, or do you want to go to medical school? So I said, no, I will, I think this is, I, I think I want to do a PhD. I put all my eggs in one basket, um, applied to the PhD program at UConn, and I did not get in. Uh, so that was, uh, that was tough. Um, but I did a bridge year. Uh, I continued doing research during that bridge year. I got into the PhD program uh, in 2008 uh, in biochemistry uh, and, and then eventually graduated in 2013. Um, over the course of my PhD with Bob Burge, um, you know, we knew we were, had a technology that we were trying to commercialize. Um, as a scientist, I knew a lot about the science, but I didn't know much about running a business. Um, so that was really hands-on. I didn't do an MBA. Um, I really was kind of on the, on the fly. Uh, but what I liked about the opportunity is that I was exposed to a lot of different things. Um, I did not have to, you know, there's only so many times in a PhD program that you can run the same protocol with different pH, different temperatures before you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go crazy. Um, this gave me an opportunity to learn a lot um, and talk to a lot of different people and hit the ground running. Uh, the one thing I will say is that it did extend my PhD a little bit longer uh, because you do have to kind of decide what is, what's for the company and what's for your PhD and have some sort of separation there. Um, and then even beyond that, uh, you know, you have to to be able to try to think about what is the future? What What's the future that you want out of this? What are you trying, why are you trying to commercialize this? Do you want to take it to, do, did I want to end with my PhD and continue to run the company? Or did I want to just learn everything I could and then go work somewhere else? Um, this happened to be during 2007, 2008, where it was economics, where the economic times were, were very difficult. Um, and I viewed this as an opportunity to really look forward and create a career for myself, where I was kind of in control, in control of, of my destiny a little bit. Um, and it's been, it's been a wild ride. Uh, so it is, it's, wasn't easy, it's still not easy. Uh, and then take that from molecular biology to doing work in aerospace, right? Um, this is, if you asked me 10 years ago if this is where I thought I would be, absolutely not. Uh, I had no idea this is where I would be. I thought I would have probably been a doctor by now. I would have been, you know, five or six years into my practice. And and that would be that. Uh, and here I am, 
doing cutting edge work on a an awesome technology and you know paving the way for future of, of biomanufacturing in, in low earth orbit. So it's been fun. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question or a few. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk and sharing everything around. It's super inspiring. Uh, I'm wondering what would you recommend to companies who are considering going to space with their product? Well, I mean, first of all, I would say don't be discouraged, right? So, I mean, if there's an opportunity there, I would have you, you know, certainly reach out to, you know, groups like the International Space Station Lab, CASIS, um, you know, implementation partners. There's a number of implementation partners out there. And really have them think about the feasibility of your project in whatever you're trying to do in microgravity. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Some of it is, um, you know, the, the feasibility of the, the project. Um, what are you really trying to learn? Is it something, you know, oftentimes people think it's, it's cool to go to space, but do you really need microgravity to do what you're doing? Or is there a way to kind of look at that and do that terrestrially? Um, so those are kind of questions that you need to ask yourself. Um, and then if you find something in microgravity that's really cool, what do you plan to do with it? Um, and how do you plan to, whether it's commercialize it or take what you're learning, do you want to use it for application on the ground and learning more things on the ground? Um, those are some, some questions you should ask yourself. If you have a really great idea and you are ready to go do something on the International Space Station, I would say, you know, reach out to an implementation partner first or CASIS again um, and and work with them to put in a proposal, uh, whatever grant application that you're trying to go through uh, so that you have, you know, show that you've thought through all of these, these different variables because it is very challenging. Um, what I would say the biggest challenge or some of the bigger challenges that we had, um, one, it was a, we had a very large system that we had to miniaturize. Uh, so we had to think about how do we take something really big and make it into a very small, almost shoebox size. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. Um, then the other challenge is how do you separate the variables in microgravity, right? Because you have one or two flights. You know, when you're thinking about doing things on the ground and in your laboratory, I say, okay, go ahead, you know, to the people in my research lab, try it out, fail. Uh, no problem. But in a microgravity environment, you might only have one chance to go to the ISS. So what is the key variable that you're really trying to answer or your key key question that you're trying to look at um, so that you can get the best data you can out of that one flight? Uh, and I would caution everybody who's doing things in microgravity not to do too many things at one time because then you don't know what is causing the, the challenge. You know, if you have a challenge in microgravity, is it because you're trying to do too many different things at one time? Uh, so really look at it as as trying to answer a single question with as, as simple of an experiment as you can the very first time as, as possible. Thank you. That's that's super useful. Uh, I, I have one more question, actually unrelated. It's about the methodology of creating the layers. Uh, I actually came across your company in some of the papers that ISS was recommending to read. And uh, initially when I read those papers, I thought that maybe you were utilizing one of the two bioprinters that are on ISS, but it seems that you are using a separate technology from those bioprinters, correct? Yes, yes. So we are using a, a separate technology. We've actually sort of manufactured uh, and worked with Space, Ta uh, Space Tango to sort of redesign um, our apparatus for our particular use. Um, though I think there are other technologies that could, could use the similar, you know, hardware that we're using. Um, but no, this isn't, you know, there are a lot of people doing traditional bioprinting. Um, this kind of similar to that, uh, but it's more of a a fluidic layering or a thin film um, process. Awesome, thank you. I also opened the chat box for anyone who wants to ask a question through that. And I think Joe had a question. Um, I don't think we can hear you, Joe. You might be muted.
We still can't hear you. In the meantime, I think Aravind has a question. Um, how does the disturbances in microgravity affect the experiments? For us, um, at, at this stage, right, I don't know if you're talking about landing or things like that. I mean, we have not had any issues in terms of, of our payloads um, with, with microgravity. Um, you know, I think certainly like some of the tissue cultures and things like that there there may be more issues uh but for what we're doing again the protein is very very stable and that binding is also very stable um so if i were were in person with you guys i would be showing you the the artificial retina that i carry around in my my wallet right so it's very very stable um and so it's pretty robust you can shake this thing up uh and and have no you know no issues there so we haven't seen much of a challenge uh, with that um next question have you looked at any amd animal models with implementation of the artificial retina sure i think i saw joe oh here he's coming back maybe he's trying to sign back in um so we got your, your question yeah we can hear you <laughs> it has it changed at all can you guys hear me now or no yeah, we can hear you okay perfect thank you um, so I'm actually a graduate student at the University of Virginia um, in an ophthalmology lab. So I'm studying age-related macular degeneration. And, um, but I'm interning right now at Kennedy Space Center. So this talk, I actually found out about this talk last night. So I was really excited to, to get a chance to listen. So my question was, I know you guys were looking at, I, I believe it was rats, uh, rat models with yeah. the retina pigmentosa. Um, have you looked at all at, at AMD models? And I know that, uh, at least from the standpoint like of, of maybe replacing that retinal layer, uh, you, you may not have the waste accumulation dysfunction in the RPE because now you're not like shedding the outer segments of, of rods and cones. That, that was kind of my thought process there. Yeah. So the so what's nice about red eye spigmatosa is it's a there's there's transgenic models, so it, it oh, is okay. a little bit easier to study that way. The right. the problem with the AMD models a lot of times is you're trying to do some sort of oxidative stress or you're doing some type of very very high light intensity. You you often don't get homogeneous degeneration in these retinas as well mm -hmm. so in terms of looking at efficacy it's very difficult to discern whether it is what we're seeing because of our artificial retina or is it because of the model and then when you compare it across multiple animals uh there may be variability between animal to animal uh and that makes it very difficult to to just tease out your your data uh overall so it's not that we haven't looked at it or considered it, um, but that is something that we've we've thought a little bit about. The other thing I would add about A and D models or just animal models in general for the retina, mm -hmm. um, this is a discussion that I have all the time. Um, so the retina is is a very sensitive space. Um, so there's there's a number of challenges. So mice and rats very very small to get anything in the back of the eye. Uh, you have to be careful of any type of surgical stretch, and it's also very different than you would do in a human. Um, so that's that's one challenge. When you look at rabbits, rabbits tend to have very big eyes and very big globes. If you're doing subretinal surgery, sometimes they tend to collapse or they get a lot of um, fibrin formation, cataract formation, which makes it very, very difficult to observe what you're seeing uh, or visualize through any type of fundus type of Im imaging. Um, Pigs are, are pretty good models, uh, but they tend to be bleeders. They have a very vascular uh, retina, so you can get a lot of blood, <laughs> leaking blood vessels, which makes it difficult. So animal model selection is something we think a lot about. Um, but what I will say in, in terms of, of, you know, the surgical development and being able to do some of the studies and the feasibility, um, pigs tend to be pretty good models, and then there's quite a few transgenic um, rat 
mouse models as well. So we've looked at at rats and, and pigs as our, our initial targets. Um, so the other thing I will say about macular degeneration though, um, there is another group doing some work in microgravity. I think the company is called Oculogenics, uh, which has got a rat model or an animal model. And I think they're trying to look at degeneration um, and the stress of kind of being in a microgravity environment and in advanced aging. Uh, so that may be a group to look out for. And they were a, a Mass Challenge Prize winner as well. Uh, and the PI is located, I think she's at University of San Diego, maybe. Um, but yeah, another, another researcher to consider. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we have time for one more question um, from Mary. What are some skills that you think young people should focus on developing to do the type of work you are doing? That's a very great question. Um, you know, I think some, you know, I, I, so I also, I have a one-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. And as I am exploring and navigating this whole, this whole field, um, you know, I think, how do we, how do we train that next workforce, right? For the ISS. I mean, if you go out there and you look at Axiom or Sierra or Blue Origin, there are hundreds of jobs out there. Um, and I think traditional training of just saying, oh my gosh, I need to be an engineer to do work in microgravity is, is not true. Um, I think it's more of these collaborations. I think you need to do more training and, and understanding what, what the potentials are that are out there for you. Um, Hands-on training as well. I, I think that there's even ways to kind of get involvement at a, uh, you know, almost like an apprenticeship. So people, we know, we now are building these commercial space stations, you need people to cut steel and welders. Um, so I think there's a way to kind of get people involved early on. And I think it's just awareness uh, is a lot of it. And letting them know that these opportunities exist. I mean, if you go right now uh, and you search some of those companies and some of their job descriptions, I mean, some of them are looking for nurses, uh, web designers, people to design, um, you know, uh, physical design and placement of things in terms of the international space stations that they're building. People are thinking about legal in space, um, political, you know, how do you change things and in, in work in, in space, um, health in space. As I mentioned, the reason I kind of wanted to point out the anthropologists is because I never knew until I was approached by by Victor that there's a whole study of anthropology in space and there's this whole group of space anthropologists um, looking at cultures in space. Uh, and I think that as we start to see these larger commercial space stations come online, that you're gonna see a lot more opportunity with things like that um, to get involved. So my advice would be to, you know, start thinking about these things as early as possible. Um, don't Think of it as just being limited to engineers. Um, and if you're a bioscientist, try to get involved with some of the ways that, or some of the groups that are doing things in microgravity, uh, just to, to start to think through, you know, how can you apply? I, I think right now we need more biologists um, doing work in microgravity because there are some nuances, you know, what works in microgravity from a fluidics perspective might not work on the, mic on the biology side. You know, we get asked those kind of questions all the time. Maybe you can't do it because of, of shearing forces or, um, I don't know, you pump something too quickly and that's bad for the protein or you can't pull a vacuum on some proteins. Um, understanding all of that and having somebody that's a, that understands that process is a very complementary skill set to, uh, you know, the engineer that's working on some of the hardware. Um, so I would say that there's a lot of different skills that you can learn. Uh, but but don't be be narrow minded in that it has to be just an engineering job. I think space is for for everyone now. All right, thank you everybody for coming to this webinar. I'm going to post my email on the chat box if you guys have any questions about ASGSR student chapter or ASGSR in general and how to get in contact with Dr. Um, Wagner and the materials from um, this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Wagner. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.